everyone on good afternoon good evening wherever you're joining us from and uh, very warm greetings very warm welcome to all of you to the 10th and final lecture in our preparatory lecture series on the road to cop 26 and CMA3. Now, as many of you already know, this has been a joint undertaking between Professor Nilufa Ura, who is the director of the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore, and Professor Christina Vogt, who is a professor at Oslo University and the newly elected chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law of the IUCN. Uh, she sends her best greetings today. She can't uh, do this session because she's got conflicting commitments, but she will certainly look at the recording. As uh, many um, of you know, this is all being recorded and made available after the lecture. Uh, now, I'm also grateful again for um, Stan Neal, who's been with us through the entire lecture series and organized this on behalf of Durham Law School, uh, jointly with Jerry from uh, the CIO at uh, National University of Singapore. And they both have done a really marvelous job in supporting us throughout this entire series. So a big thank you to you as well, Stan. Um, and um, now I would like to introduce our final speaker in this lecture series. But when I say final, I would also alert you to the fact that after COP26, of course, we are going to look at COP27 in the next year. And we would like uh, to invite you to uh, probably hybrid and online um, panel on the 26th of November, more information will be going out in due course. And this will bring together again all speakers in this series, and they will provide a short introduction in terms of what has now happened during COP26, uh, and then open the floor to more questions and a very lively discussion to see uh, how we can the, bring together these events that have happened, and then uh, maybe be prepared again for the next uh, COP27 but also for the global stock take uh, that will take place in 2023, as you know. Now, I'm extremely grateful and very excited to have Linda Siegler with us this morning. And uh, Linda Siegler is a real expert, uh, has been for a long time involved in the UNFCCC negotiations, and she's an environmental lawyer based in the UK. She's been involved um, in the negotiations, in fact, since 2005. So uh, this is really the time when the Kyoto Protocol uh, was uh, brought to life. And uh, so she will give us today an insight into a very important topic. She has focused on this for a long time on adaptation and loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change. She's very familiar with the climate change concerns of small island developing states and has worked with them and of least developed countries. And she has directly supported country delegations through the provision of strategic legal and policy advice. Now, in addition, Linda also teaches on environmental law subjects at the postgraduate level, and she has conducted a number of negotiation skills training sessions for a wide range of developing country groups in Africa, the Caribbean, the Pacific, and the Southeast Asia. She has written extensively on a variety of environmental law topics and is currently working towards a PhD in the area of green building regulation. Now, her degrees include a Juris Doctor and a Master of Laws, and she's a native English speaker and very impressively fluent in Spanish, in Russian, and has studied German at the graduate level. So, good morning, Linda, and she will talk today about the compensation question, loss and damages. Thank you, Linda, and the floor is yours. Vielen Dank, Petra. <laughs> um, I will now share my screen. Um, and then I will do my, my uh, introductions and thank yous. Um, let's see here. I hope everyone can see my screen. I'll put it in uh, presentation mode. Good. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank um, Nilufer and Christina and certainly Petra um, and Stan um, for uh, facilitating my um, attendance here. I have attended each of these lecture seminars since I think we were speaking about it being in February. So here we are in October and I have the great pleasure um, of, of being the last speaker and, and uh, 
and uh, hope that I can uh, do justice to all of those who came before me who provided really compelling insights into um, the UN Framework Convention on, on Climate Change, um, the run-up to COP26, and certainly the Paris Agreement. So um, as announced, I will be talking about loss and damage. I've switched the title a bit um, because I'm going to focus on loss and damage, and compensation comes in for sure, but um, we'll see how it has been um, a potentially quite difficult issue over time. Um, I will begin by looking at principles of international environmental law. I think, first of all, my lecture will take about an hour, so I hope that we have plenty of time for questions and answers after that. Looking at principles of international environmental law, which I believe are relevant to the loss and damage debate or discussions. Um, looking at highlights of loss and damage in the UN system from before the time that the UNFCCC was um, agreed and ad adopted. Um, then looking at where we might be able to find loss and damage under the UNF the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, um, and then taking a, a kind of a side look at the intergovernment intergovernmental panel on climate change and their notions of loss and damage and where we find loss and damage in those scientific assessments um, before we um, leap into where loss and damage uh, sits in the Paris Agreement, um, however comfortably or not, and, uh, and uh, finish up with uh, the last face-to-face -face meeting we had where um, the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage was reviewed in 2019 at the Madrid uh, COP25 uh, CMA2. And then finally have a, a quick look at loss and damage at COP26 CMA3. I hope I don't give this too um, much of a, a cursory uh, uh, view, um, but, I, but I do think having the history and understanding where loss and damage came from and, and how it landed in the convention processes is one of my main aims today, and I think will set you up for understanding what the outcomes of COP26 might, might be. Okay, so just looking at um, the principles of international environmental law that I believe are relevant to the loss and damage debate, I think first and foremost is the no harm rule, which uh, where states are under a, a, an obligation not to cause harm to the environment of other states or to the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, the, the, the central um, issue here is causation and harm. Um, the precautionary principle, where there are where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, the lap, lack of uh, scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing cost effect, effective measures to prevent environmental degradation, or we could replace that with harm. That is more or less the Rio uh, Declaration's uh, definition of the precautionary principle. Um, and then we have the polluter pays principle, which, um, which basically says that the polluter should, in principle, bear the cost of pollution. And finally, and I think this is perhaps a little more difficult, but we will revisit this a few times over the course of the next hour, is this notion of, uh, of state responsibility for internationally wrongful acts, um, where one state causes harm in another. Um, the, the immediate um, requirement of, of that is for the state causing the harm to cease the wrongful act um, and to provide reparation for the injury caused in um, one of three ways uh, through restitution, i.e. putting things back the way they were, compensation, i.e. providing some sort of monetary value for whatever damage was incurred, or satisfaction, which is uh, more of a, a, a a reparation for moral a damage, um, such as acknowledgement of a breach of law or a, an expression of regret. Um, I think the wrongful act issue is something that I don't want to get into a large debate about um, at this lecture, but I think um, deciding whether or not um, emitting greenhouse gases is a wrongful act is, is perhaps central to where um, state responsibility really fits in. Okay. So what I wanna do is go back. Loss and damage might seem like a new issue under the UNF, a relatively new issue under the UNFCCC, but it's not. Um, it goes back a long time and elements of the loss and damage um, discussions were around 
um, before the UNFCCC was even um, adopted and even before the negotiation process. So I just highlight some of the uh, UN Gen General Assembly resolutions and various other um, activities that went on um, in, in the run-up to the adoption of the Framework Convention itself. In December 1989, the UN General Assembly issued two relevant re resolutions, um, one 24206 on the possible adverse effects of sea level rise on island and coastal areas, particularly low-lying coastal areas. And we'll see that one of the um, slow onset impacts that's embraced now under the convention process is sea level rise. So sea level rise and the recognition by island states that this could um, create serious irreversible damage and impacts was, was around uh, for a pretty long time um, and certainly before um, the the negotiation process uh, uh, for the framework convention started. Another um, uh, subsequent uh, UN General Assembly uh, resolution is protection of global climate for present and future generations of mankind. And that's UNGA resolution 44207, also adopted in 1989. And I will talk about the intergenerational aspects of loss and damage um, as we go forward. Among other things, Resolution 44206 recommends that um, vulnerability of affected countries, that the vulnerability of affected countries to sea level rise um, uh, should be considered during discussions of a draft framework convention on climate. So it was already envisioned that um, certain impacts of climate change, which could cause loss and damage, should be included in the convention itself. Um, and Resolution 44207 also, in addition to looking at uh, protection for uh, present and future generations also recommended the negotiation of a draft, draft framework convention on climate change. So we're starting to see the building up of momentum around um, not only just climate change, but the inclusion of notions of loss and damage right from the very beginning. So in 1990, um, the following year through resolution 45212, the UNGA established the International Negotiating Committee, the INC, to prepare the Framework Convention, with the first ne negotiating session scheduled for February 1991, the objective being to have the draft Framework Convention ready for June 1992, which is when um, the Rio de Janeiro Conference, the UN Conference on Environment and Development, or the Earth Summit, um, was convened. At the same 1990 session of the UN General Assembly, members recognized that climate change and sea level rise would seriously threaten low-lying islands and coastal zones. So again, a reaffirmation of um, the potential impacts of climate change as early as 1990. So the momentum was building towards a proposal on sea level rise, which was actually tabled by Vanuatu, a, a South Pacific country, on behalf of the newly formed Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, at um, a, an international negotiating committee meeting in December of 1991. And this proposal was an annex to an article that was in, in the existing draft on insurance mechanisms. So let's see what was in that proposal. The Vanuatu proposal, which, it, which was a piece of um, the insurance mechanism that was already in the draft text, uh, called for the establishment of an international climate fund and for a separate international insurance pool to provide financial insurance against the consequences of sea level rise. And in formulating this insurance pool, parties would need to consider the methods of funding the pool, the types of loss to be covered, how to evaluate loss from sea level rise, and uh, limitations on the amount of compensation payable. So you can already start to see that there are uh, issues around responsibility, compensation, notions of irreversible damage, um, entering into um, the, the negotiating process in 1991. Um, the formula for determining how to fund this insurance pool was first of all, that it would be a, a funded through an assessment on developed countries, and uh, that this would be based on a formula 
um, that was modeled on a formula in the 1963 Brussels Supplementary Convention on Third Party Liability in the field of nuclear en energy. So we're also seeing that this there, there's the notions of liability are coming into this 19, 1991 um, Vanuatu proposal for AOSIS. And the formula that was proposed was 50% based on uh, uh, GDP and 50% based on the level of CO2 emissions. So you can see that that this formula is responsibility for causing the, the, the loss or the damage based on level of CO2 emissions, but also ability to pay. Um, and, and, and so that was the, uh, the proposal around how to uh, compensate small island developing states and low-lying coastal states for um, inundation associated with sea level rise. Okay, um, so where did, where did we get to in 1992 when the UNFCCC was, um, was actually adopted? The only real remnant of language on insurance that can be found in the UNFCCC is in Article 4.8. And this has its own set of real concerns, and I'll talk talk to you a little bit more about that. But uh, the, the chapeau of this article um, reads, in the implementation of the commitments um, in this article, uh, that Article 4 is on commitments, the party shall give full consideration to what actions are necessary under the convention, including ash actions related to funding, insurance, the transfer of technology, to meet the specific uh, needs and concerns of developing country parties arising from the adverse effects of climate change. Okay, so we're in, in adaptation mode and or the impact of the implementation of response measures. What are response measures? Those are measures that countries take to mitigate their greenhouse gas emissions. And so this is linking um, adap uh, adaptation to the adverse effects of climate change with impacts on countries um, that have fossil fuel based economies um, and, and may have economic, may suffer economic losses as a result of a transition or transformation of our economies to a low carbon um, uh, emitting society. So it, those are, are very opposite and very strange bedfellows. And we'll see how, um, how difficult that became certainly in the early years around discussions on adaptation. The, the largest, so that, that's sort of where insurance landed in the UNFCCC, um, flying out and, and taking more of a helicopter view of the UNFCCC. I wanna kind of highlight areas where we find notions around duty of care, um, responsibility uh, and, and vulnerability. So we start with the preamble, um, which, uh, notes that the largest share of historical and current global um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, has originated in developed countries. So we're starting to see a notion of, around responsibility for, for impacts. That the global nature of climate change calls for an international response, um, but that this response must be in accordance with the notion of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. So there's, there, there's already, a, uh, an understanding that responsibility is on all parties to meet their obligations under the, under the convention, but that some parties are more capable of meeting those responsibilities than others. Um, that states have the sovereign right to exploit their natural resources, but the responsibility to ensure that those activities within their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage to the environment of other states. So this is in the preambular language of the UNFCCC, um, a restatement of the no harm rule. Um, and then finally, um, it recalls a number of the UN General Assembly res resolutions, which I, I looked at um, a, a few slides ago, including the 44206 uh, resolution from 1989, on the possible adverse effects of sea level rise on islands and low-lying coastal areas. So that's the preamble. It sets us up for the operative part of uh, the convention. The objective itself, the ultimate objective of, of the convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas emission concentrations to prevent he, uh, dangerous human interference with the climate system. And I think this is really the, the key point Loss and damage is not mentioned at all in, in um, the UN Framework Convention, but you could infer 
that it's a result of not stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations quickly enough because the stabilization process has to happen within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to ensure that food production is not threatened and to enable economic development um, to proceed in a sustainable manner if if that if that time frame is missed and if stabilization of greenhouse gases hasn't happened soon enough, and we'll look at the science and what the science is saying about those time frames, then um, the, a, a, a logical possible outcome of missing that time frame is loss and damage. So there's kind of an inherent understanding even in, in the ultimate objective from my point of view um, that, that, that loss and damage is, is, is a possibility. Um, just to look again at the principles of the convention and where I find responsibility and 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 uh, and and a duty of care um, around potential uh, liability or cause um, that parties should protect the climate system on the basis of equity and in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, and that developed country parties should take the lead in uh, combating climate change and its adverse effects. So we see a differentiation of responsibility, again, um, set out in, in clearer language than the preamble itself. The specific needs and special circumstances of particularly vulnerable development developing country parties should be given full consideration. So, so that I think in my mind, that it's kind of where I find a duty of care that, that, that there's a, a recognition that some parties are more vulnerable to these impacts and that and that, um, that that should be taken into consideration. And there's a duty of care there amongst other parties to, to um, fully consider those specific needs and special circumstances. And um, Article 3.3 is, is a, a, a restatement of the precautionary principle principle. Um, it, it, it says where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage. And so we do have the word damage in the convention. Um, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing the taking of precautionary measures to anticipate, prevent, or minimize the causes of climate change and its adverse effects. So we see ingredients um, for loss and damage. Um, and certainly this notion around timeframes is I think um, something that we're, we're becoming far more aware of now than, than I think um, anyone could have anticipated in 1992. I'm going back to article 4.8. Um, which linked uh, action to address the adverse effects of climate change with the possible economic impacts of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions on those countries with eco economies highly dependent on income generated from the production of fossil fuels. So it's linking um, addressing the adverse effects of climate change in particular in um, uh, de developing countries with um, economic impacts associated with actually stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions in in the uh, in the climate system, which 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 is almost antithetical to one another. But that was a political decision um, at, at that point in time. What it what it managed to do historically was significantly um, uh, chill the ability of, of countries to make positive progr progress on adaptation to the adverse effects of climate change under the convention. So we're not even talking about getting to a point where we're, we're not naturally adapting, but we're, we're actually being hindered by a, a political arrangement that doesn't really make logical sense. This linkage was finally broken in 2007. We have a decision um, that was taken in Bali called the Bali Action Plan. For those of you uh, who don't have the historical memory that I have, the Bali Action Plan was a roadmap to get to two years ahead of, of what was supposed to be the Paris Agreement um, in Copenhagen in 2009. We'll talk about how that fell apart a little bit, um, but. Um, Decision 1 CP 13, the Bali Action Plan, was the roadmap to get to a, a, a legally binding or some form of legal outcome on climate change um, in 2009. Um, and this decision severed the link between response measures and um, the adaptation to the adverse effects of climate change. And I think that was a really important 
moment in um, the convention, the history of the convention, because finally um, we could look at impacts on vulnerable countries and and the the economic um, associations with with mitigating and moving towards a low carbon society. So the the Bali Action Plan sets response measures in a, a, a paragraph on mitigation, and it then sets out a, a, a whole sub paragraph on enhanced action on adaptation, which, like I said, is, is, is was a watershed moment. Um, moreover, this sub paragraph 1C in the Bali Action Plan includes provisions on risk management and risk reduction strategies, including risk sharing and transfer mechanisms such as insurance. We're, we're starting to see these notions of the Vanuatu proposal come back in to the convention process here. And this separate paragraph also talks about means to address loss and damage. So this is really the first time that loss and damage as a term enters the convention process associated with um, the climate change impacts. Um, so, so just giving you some, some history here on how loss and damage re-entered the process. In the run-up to COP15, which was the Copenhagen COP in 2009, a number of parties put draft textual proposals for legally binding agreements on the table. Um, and I can think of several examples, the African Group of Negotiators, the Alliance of Small Island States and the Least Developed Countries put uh, on the table draft texts that they would hope would be adopted in Copenhagen. And each of those that I just mentioned included some form of paragraph or some mention of loss and damage. So loss and damage is not only in a decision, but it's starting to be put on the table as a potential element of a legally binding agreement. Um, unfortunately, Copenhagen kind of ended in, in a shambles. I was there, it was, was really disheartening, I must say. Um, and, and all that could be, um, the, the only outcome of Copenhagen was, was noting a, a very kind of sloppy um, uh, thing called the Copenhagen Accord, a, a two-page piece, a two-page document that was really uh, not very well, well put together. Um, so it was kind of a crisis in the, in the, the international climate process. Um, the following year at COP16 in Cancun in Mexico, um, parties worked really hard to pick up the pieces from Copenhagen. And, um, and, and the picking up of the pieces, um, it came in the form of a very large omnibus decision, the Cancun Agreements, Decision 1 CP16, which, um, which among many other things, including the um, the establishment of a, an adaptation framework and the adaptation committee recognized the need to understand um, and reduce loss and damage. And it established a work program to do so, a two-year work program. Um, the Cancun decision also in a footnote provides a non-exhaustive list of slow onset events, which includes um, uh, the, the, the favorite sea level rise, but also increasing temperatures, ocean acidification, glacial retreat, land and forest degra degradation, and loss of biodiversity and desertification. And I think this list is important because what it does is it moves the, the, the idea of loss and damage out of just the realm for islands, sea level rise, and low-lying coastal areas. And it starts to, to, um, to broaden the picture of, of what kinds of impacts could create loss and damage um, across a, a broader uh, swath of certainly the developing world. Um, the, the work program took a year to negotiate and, uh, and then another year to happen. Um, and uh, at COP18, uh, two years later in Doha in 2012, parties agreed on the role of the convention in promoting the implementation of approaches to address loss and damage. And the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about that role. Um, and it envisioned the establishment of institutional arrangements under the convention um, to do so. Uh, parties kind of ran out of time um, in Doha um, for, uh, uh, for agreeing on the nature of these institutional arrangements, but set the seed for that to happen in the following, in the following year. Um, at COP19, and so this is what I'm going to talk about now, is this institutional arrangement, which is known as the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. Um, it's, a, you know, 
in, in the world of, uh, of acronyms that we live in in the UNFCCC, it's, it's um, conveniently known as the WIM, and I will call it the WIM from now on. Um, uh, the WIM was established by Decision 2 CP19 in Warsaw to fulfill the role of the convention in promoting the implementation of approaches to address loss and damage, including extreme events and slow onset events. And, I, and I'm going to highlight this last little piece. In developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. So, so the Warsaw International Mechanism mechanism is really geared at looking at loss and damage in vulnerable developing countries. And we looked at the convention um, and, and the need to consider the special needs and circumstances of particularly uh, vulnerable developing countries. And, and this, is, this is what the WIM was established for. Um, it has three functions and they're based directly on the role of the convention itself. That's enhancing knowledge and understanding around loss and damage, strengthening dialogue, coordination, co coherence, and synergies among uh, stakeholders, both inside and outside the convention, and enhancing action and support, including finance, technology, transfer, and capacity building. And those remain the three functions of the WIM um, today. Um, an executive committee was established to guide the implementation of the functions of the WIM, um, and, um, and, and that continues to operate now and we'll talk a little bit about how the WIM, uh, WIM XCOM is, is set up. Um, but also in that Warsaw decision, it's notable that the WIM was established under the Cancun Adaptation Framework. So this idea that um, loss and damage is sort of an extension of adaptation um, what was, was continued. Um, it was a concession on, on the part of some parties. Um, and in the preambular language of the decision text, um, parties acknowledge that loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change includes, but in some cases involves more than that which can be reduced by adaptation. So entering into the convention process now is this notion that there are limits to adaptation. And, and you know, cast your mind back to Article Two, um, the ultimate objective that you that we, we need to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions within a time frame. Parties are starting to acknowledge that that time frame might have been might ha have been missed, and nat natural adaptation there may be limits to that. Um, and finally, Decision Two CP nineteen sets up a review uh, uh, three years uh, hence as a possible way of reassessing the placement of the WIM in the Convention's architecture. So the, the the establishment under the Cancun Adaptation Framework and the and the the three year review um, was a political uh, trade off. Um, so let's just look briefly at the WIM XCOM because it's really the engine that drives the WIM and, and it's been operating um, formally since 2015 um, and, and had its last uh, meeting, its 14th meeting uh, last month. It's composed of 10 developed country members and 10 developing country members. It meets at least twice a year. Um, and and uh, the meetings are set up and, and uh, it facilitated by, by the uh, Secretariat of the UNFCCC. It guides the implementation of the functions of the WIM via a five-year rolling work plan that consists of five strategic work streams. Um, a work stream on slow onset events, a work stream on non-economic losses, a work stream on comprehensive risk management, uh, one on human mobility and a work stream, which is more or less cross cutting on action and support, which includes finance, technology, transfer and capacity building. The XCOM also has the authority to establish subgroups or expert groups to assist it with the implementation of the work plan. And each of the five work streams now has a dedicated group of experts who actually volunteer their time um, to support the work of the XCOM. Um, and the implementation of the work plan. Okay, this is the sidebar. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the arbiter of best available science um, on, on climate change. It doesn't do its own research, but it assesses um, the, the level of, of science. Um, and, and where we start to find the notion of loss and damage coming up in some of these assessment reports. Um, the first assessment report that the IPCC put out was in 1990, 
And it led to um, the creation of the International Negotiating Committee, or what is one of the factors that led to the uh, creation of the International Negotiating Committee, um, uh, which uh, negotiated and, and eventually adopted the, the uh, UNFCCC itself. But we don't really see the notion of loss and damage coming into IPCC reports, to the best of my knowledge, uh, until 2014. Um, in the fifth assessment report um, on the working group that looked at impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, uh, where there was a recognition that there might be limits to adaptation. So we see in 2013 in a, a decision that parties acknowledge there may be limits to adaptation. And in the IPCC report from the following year, it starts to categorize what these limits might look like. And it, it looks at hard limits, which are those that will not change, um, probably a failed e ecosystem or, or a, 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 a species that has become extinct, for example, or soft limits, which can change over time, perhaps due to increased capacity or improved technology or, or something of that sort. Um, so, so no mention of loss and damage, but certainly um, starting to, to push the envelope around the limits to adaptation. Four years later, and this is after Paris, and I'll talk about Paris next. Um, four years later in 2018, um, uh, the IPCC was invited by parties to prepare a special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this was a direct invitation that came out of the Paris um, meeting um, in the decision that adopted the Paris Agreement itself. And this special report actually starts to talk about loss and damage. Um, there's a few highlights from this report um, that look that says risks across critical sectors are projected to increase at 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to present day levels and increase uh, further at two degrees Celsius, limiting adaptation opportunities and increasing loss and damage. So we're, we're moving not only just from limits to adaptation, but we're moving to looking at actual losses and damages. Highlight, it highlights three areas of concern in the context of loss and damage at 1.5 degrees Celsius, a lack of data, gaps in financial assessments, and a, a lack of targeted policies or mechanisms to address these issues. And these are um, concerns of developing countries. Um, and it limits, uh, and, and it says that limiting temperature increase to 1.5 as degrees Celsius versus two degrees Celsius is expected to reduce a number of risks, particularly when coupled with adaptation efforts that take into account sustainable development. So there is a way to actually um, potentially limit um, the losses and damages that may be associated with these temperature increases. And I will, um, the final one, and this is brand new, from uh, er, slightly earlier this year, um, two months ago, the sixth assessment report, uh, working group one uh, report on the physical science basis of, of uh, climate change came out. Um, and I think it's really quite interesting, particularly from a legal perspective. And if we're trying to look at notions around liability, i.e. responsibility for climate change, and, um, and, and what, we can, what we might be able to do about it. Um, and the sixth assessment report really looks at loss and damage in the connection with attribution. Attribution uh, of, for, the, for the, the cause, the, the human cause of extreme events um, versus the natural vari variability. Um, and that this can be of rele relevance for assessing adaptation challenges and issues of loss and damage. So this notion of being able to, of the science being better at figuring out um, what the cause of, of this loss and damage is, is starting to enter into the scientific um, literature. Um, and and another, uh, a, a, another finding in, in the sixth assessment report is attribution assessments. And I think this is fundamentally interesting as a lawyer, uh, attribution assessments can serve to inform loss and damage, damage estimates and potential climate litigation cases by estimating the costs of climate change. I think that's hugely significant. Um, certainly this litigation is, is, is uh, probably envisioned to happen at the domestic level, but nevertheless, um, we're bringing in um, a, 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 an ability to identify and quantify um, the costs of climate change and potential loss and damage. Okay, 
So take a breath. We looked at the science um, and we're going to kind of finish up now um, with a look at how loss and damage uh, is portrayed in the 2015 Paris Agreement. Um, so Article 8 of the Paris Agreement, in Article 8, um, parties recognize the importance of averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage. And these two new words, averting and minimizing, have entered into the loss and damage vernacular. Um, the, the climate, the, the convention uh, decisions talk about addressing loss and damage, whereas this averting and minimizing brings in the notion that there are ways, um, perhaps, of avoiding loss and damage altogether. Um, and this is including extreme uh, weather events and slow onset events. Article 8.2 uh, provides that the whim shall be subject to um, the, the authority and guidance of the CMA and may be enhanced and strengthened by it. And this um, is uh, the subject of a, of a fairly controversial political issue that I'll uh, talk about coming up. And Article 8.3 provides that enhanced understanding, action, and support with respect to loss and damage should be carried out on a cooperative and in a cooperative and fa facilitative manner. And then Article 8.4 lists the areas of work for this co cooperation and facilitation, and this include early warning systems, emergency preparedness, slow onset events. Um, comprehensive risk management and a number of others. Um, sort of kind of a random non-exhaustive list of, of areas of work. Um, so this little, um, these three bullet points are my own personal um, assessment uh, of, of Article 8. Um, outside of the use of the word support, there are no provisions in Article 8 for financing approaches to address, avert, minimize and address loss and damage. So the word support is, is all you really get within the, the bounds, the four corners of that article. Um, and there's no differentiation between developed and de developing country parties. There is no mention of, of developed uh, country parties or developing country parties at all in Article 8. It just talks about parties. And, uh, and, and when you look back at the establishment of the WIM in, uh, in uh, 2013, this was a mechanism to address loss and damage in particularly vulnerable developing countries. So that's a big change in my, um, in my, from my perspective. And then finally, the, the big kind of kicker is in decision one CP21, paragraph 51, parties agreed that article eight of the agreement does not involve or provide a basis for any liability or compensation. Um, it's a fairly famous article, paragraph 51. It, it doesn't sit in the agreement itself. Um, it was that that language was originally in, in uh, agreement language. It was moved to the to the adopting uh, COP decision. Nevertheless, it it really does ring fence Article Eight in terms of um, a party's uh, ability to to um, look at or consider liability or compensation um, in in that specific article um, dedicated to loss and damage. And that was really the quid pro quo for getting Article 8 on loss and damage in the Paris Agreement. I mean, I think everyone understands understands that, but uh, the arrangement has has led to some difficulties, um, which will, will be continued to be discussed at COP26, and we'll go into that. What I want to do then is step back and say, all right, we have paragraph 51, no liability and compensation. However, when parties um, ratified or acceded to the Paris Agreement, um, they, and the Paris Agreement doesn't allow you to reserve on any particular paragraph. It's you either take all the, all the articles or no articles, everything, it's all or nothing, which is fairly common for um, the multilateral environmental agreements that I'm familiar with. However, when parties ratified or exceeded um, to the agreement, a number of them um, deposited declarations about their understanding of this agreement. And this is just a, a excerpt, a, a selection of excerpts from, from different de declarations. Some They're similar, slightly different wording. Um, acceptance of the Paris Agreement and its application shall in no way constitute a renunciation of any rights under international law concerning state responsibility for the adverse effects of climate change and that no provision in the Paris Agreement can be interpreted as derogating from principles of general international law or any claims or rights concerning compensation due to um, the adverse effects of climate change or the impacts of climate change. 
So parties are already saying, okay, we understand that there was this agreement um, in paragraph 51, but the Paris Agreement does not um, limit our rights um, under international law. And we looked at um, the, the principle of state responsibility for wrongful acts um, very early on. And, and this is a, this is a, a, a restatement of, of some of those principles and notions. Um, uh, the, the second one is very similar to the first, um, but it talks not only about compensation, it, it introduces liability. And I think this third one is, is very interesting. Um, it, it says accession to and the implementation of the Paris Agreement shall in no way constitute a rens renunciation of rights under any local and international laws or treaties, including those concerning state responsibility for loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change. So actually, this de declaration goes straight to the heart of the matter and talks about, about loss and damage. All of these declarations are available um, on the UN Treaty Series website um, uh, under the Paris Agreement um, filing. Okay, um, so again, a, a little bit of a sidestep, but I think very relevant. Um, so we've seen that parties have declared um, that the Paris Agreement won't... Um, won't compromise their rights under international law, and in particular under um, the law of state responsibility. And what um, certain parties have tried to do is try to push a little bit further um, if, uh, and get a, some sort of advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, which is the world court. Um, and, and an advisory opinion is not binding, but it's certainly very persuasive. Um, so this was tried in 2011 by Palau um, and the Marshall Islands was involved initially. And then um, uh, Palau was later joined by uh, Grenada in the Caribbean, where Palau called on the UN General, General Assembly to urgently seek an advisory opinion as to whether countries uh, have a, a legal responsibility to ensure that any activities on their territory that emit green, greenhouse gases um, uh, do not harm other states. In other words, looking at how um, state responsibility for transboundary harm caused by greenhouse gases might be treated under international law. Um, it, it, it really didn't go anywhere. There, there wasn't a, a, a majority uh, of, of parties in the UN General Assembly who agreed to make that call. Um, but during, during the about two or three years that Palau was putting this um, proposal forward, um, it stressed that it was not the intention to focus blame on major emitters of greenhouse gases. Um, it was to recommit um, parties to the urgency of, of having a, a set of normative standards established around climate change to complement the work um, under the UNGA and, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So I think this, this uh, and this was part of a press conference, so it's loose language, it's not legal language, but this notion that some countries are really concerned about uh, blame and focusing blame and and um, and then the, the position at least the stated position of a number of other countries is no we're not we're trying to focus blame we're just trying to um, we're, we're, we're trying to survive and, and we're, we're working to um, to understand what the legal process can help us do to, to get there um, 10 years later um, uh, and this hasn't this hasn't come in front of the UN General Assembly yet but it's certainly been announced to Vanuatu. Um, who we met in 1991, um, is going to propose uh, that the UN General Assembly uh, uh, request the ICJ uh, for clarification of responsibilities for climate change under international law. So a, a, a similar a cast of, of an advisory opinion from the ICJ trying again 10 years later. Um, this is, a, this is a, a culmination of a campaign that was started by Pacific Island students fighting climate change. That's the name of their organization. And I think what's beautiful in my mind about this is that this is really brings in the notion of, of intergenerational impacts and future generations. And, and that this is something that was started by a group of students in the Pacific who are really concerned about um, the future of, of, their, of their region. Um, and, and so we... we, we we go right back to the initial UN resolutions around future uh, uh, climate change and future generations. And I think this is a, a, a particularly poignant um, aspect of, of this uh, for me. Okay, 
I know I, I, I know I may be bouncing around a lot and we're, ne we're nearly done. I'm nearly at my hour. Um, so we saw that the Paris Agreement kind of has the four corners uh, uh, around Article 8, and it's very confined, no liability and compensation. Parties are reaching outside the, the, the convention process, certainly outside the Paris Agreement process, to make declarations about um, their understandings and, and searching for, for opinions around international law in this area. Um, but within the, the uh, Paris Agreement process, once it was came into force, there was a two-year um, period where parties had to negotiate the rule book for um, for this Paris Agreement because it entered into force before parties had the chance to do that. So in 2014, at the at the COP in Katowice, um, uh, the the rule book, the Paris rule book, minus a few elements, um, was agreed, and this is called the Katowice Climate Package. And what happened over that two or two year process from in, uh, entry into force of the Paris Agreement and the agreement of the rule book was that parties worked hard to hop out of the Article Eight conf confines and and try and and push loss and damage into um, the the uh, the, the ratchet mechanism or the process by which ambition increases over time under the Paris Agreement and 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 had a, a fair amount of success. Um, the enhanced transparency framework, which is a, the reporting process where parties report every two years on um, their uh, implementation of their nationally determined contributions. Um, that there is a possibility for parties to provide um, information related to um, enhancing understanding, action, and support on a cooperative and facilitative basis. This is the language from Article 8 um, uh, to avert, minimize, and address loss and damage. So the, there's a possibility now through the Paris um, mechanisms to report on on a voluntary basis to report on loss and damage. So we we can find that loss and damage has entered into a larger sphere under the Paris Agreement. And there again, um, again, coming out of Katowice under the global stock take, which is the decision 19 CMA1. And, and Petra mentioned that the, the uh, upcoming work on the global stock take, um, actually the technical phase and uh, information gathering will start early next year. We see that loss and damage is uh, kind of um, sprinkled throughout the decision on the global stock take. So parties may take into account efforts to avert, minimize and address loss and damage um, when they're put, working on the technical assessment phase under the global stock take, um, relevant constituted bodies, um, including the XCOM, the WIM XCOM, are invited to prepare a synthesis, synthesis report on their work as a contribution to the technical assessment phase. So loss and damage will enter through report of the XCOM and then the sources of income uh, input to the um, global stock take. Um, include uh, input um, on efforts to enhance understanding, action, and support on uh, averting, minimizing, and uh, addressing loss and damage. So we see that um, the tentacles of loss and damage have, have flowed uh, uh, outside uh, the Article 8 uh, of the Paris Agreement um, through the implementation of, the, of the, the rule book or the implementation of the Paris Agreement itself. Um, those were hard won um, battles. Uh, but I think quite useful. Uh, this is the final slide before we um, get to COP26, which I know everyone is, is um, excited to, to uh, get to get to. Um, in 2019, the last face-to-face -face, uh, COP we had, and certainly the last COP we had, uh, COP25, CMA2, um, the, uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism had its second review, um, the 2019 review of the Warsaw International Mechanism. It, uh, it, the, the outcomes of the, of the review sit in a, in a CMA, a Paris Agreement decision, um, but there has been no uh, agreement so far on the governance of the WIM. Um, so there is a, a, a mirroring COP decision which acknowledges the outcomes of, uh, of the review in the CMA decision itself. Um, there are a number of significant provisions on action and support, including finance, um, but no binding commitments on developed country parties to um, to continue to to increase um, their uh, funding for loss and damage. So lots of good things about 
say it, said about the need to finance loss and damage, but no real commitment um, around that. Um, the XCOM from a finance perspective um, is engaging more, uh, uh, more robustly with the Standing Committee on Finance. Um, it has been requested to collaborate with the Green Climate Fund to clarify how developing countries may, uh, may, may uh, access funding for loss and damage. Um, and a new body called the Santiago Network was established to catalyze the technical assistance of relevant organizations, bodies, networks, and experts for the implementation of, of uh, approaches to address loss and damage in particularly vulnerable developing countries. So at least we, we start to see the, the idea that um, loss and damage is, is particularly concerning for uh, vulnerable developing countries. Um, and that these organizations, et cetera, are to report to the XCOM on technical assistance, uh, the tech, technical assist, assistance they provide. And, um, and this reporting uh, process began this year. Um, and um, the, nevertheless, the issue of governance of the WIM, whether it should be solely governed by the, by the, the governing body of the Paris Agreement, the CMA, or jointly by the COP and the CMA was not resolved. Um, but there's a mandate to take up this matter at, uh, soon in, at COP26. Um, and, and why is that important? Um, for the most part, developing countries believe that there should be joint governance. Parties agreed on the role of the convention. Parties agreed that, um, that, that the functions of the WIM were based directly on, that, on the role of the convention. Um, there's concern that Article 8 of the Paris Agreement really doesn't talk about it talks about governing the whim, but it doesn't talk about its functions. It has some notion around enhancing the whim, but that's not clear. And, and there is deep concern among some parties that by, um, by not allowing the COP to continue to have a role in governing the whim, that a lot of the work, the good work and the agreements that were, um, were uh, made or the decisions that were made um, in advance of the Paris Agreement could be lost. Um, however, there is a position uh, most notably among developed country parties that um, the CMA has sole governance of, of the WIM based on Article 8.2. And, um, and I, I don't think it's a secret that, uh, that one of the, their concerns is, is keeping um, Article 8 of the Paris Agreement um, contained as a result of the uh, paragraph 51 uh, exclusion of liability and compensation. Um, so th there's really a, a, a binary set of choices. And I think that's really at the end of the day going to be a political decision. And I'm not sure how close um, the parties will come to that, but governance of the whim will be discussed at COP26. Um, the reports of the XCOM, um, two years of reporting because we missed out a year um, due to the pandemic and, and no, no COPs and no, uh, no conferences. So two reports of the XCOM will be uh, considered um, and the Santiago Network, which is, was established in Madrid, um, will be looked at. Um, the COP presidencies, uh, Chile, which is the current president and, uh, and the incoming UK presidencies have convened a number of informal discussions around what this Santiago network should look like and how it should be operationalized. Um, but there seems to be some, there's still some concerns uh, amongst some parties that they want to have a, a more fulsome uh, discussion with an, a, a, an ensuing decision whilst other parties are, are the position hey, it's working fine, let's not worry about it. So where, where that discussion will happen at COP26 CMA3 is, is still kind of up in the air. Um, then uh, sources of input for the global stock take has been discussed by the subsidiary body on scientific and technological advice. And these are this discussion is to try and expand the sources of income um, uh, in the GST decision from Katowice, um, and, and that's a potential area for including more loss and damage um, elements in the global stock take process. And finally, um, the, initi the initi initiation of deliberations around the new collective quanti quantified finance goal will begin at COP26, and this provides an opportunity to include um, finance 
for loss and damage in in this discussions um, and, and broaden it out from from certainly um, the provisions of the 2019 review of the WIM. That <laughs> is it. I think I met my hour. <laughs> I, I know this was a real fast romp through, romp through everything, but thanks everyone for your attention. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that I can. Um, it's a fairly complex set of issues and, and goes back much further than I think many of us ever realized it did. Um, but I will stop sharing my screen and uh, hand back to Petra and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Linda. That was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. A really comprehensive overview over the early development, the, ch the changes that took place before it was then adopted as part of the 2015 Paris Agreement, and then also what has happened since and what can we expect from COP26. So I think you covered everything. So thank you again very much. That was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Now, um, what uh, yeah. normally... Pardon, say, yes, you yeah, I'm going to step in as well, um, uh, yes. Petra, because I also wanted to say to thank Linda. I think this was really a ter uh, absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. It's probably one of the clearest ones I've had, and I have a better understanding um, uh, of the loss and damage issues. And I think the history was really important um, because this has been going on since 1989. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 I think state states responses to this has been a slow onset event, frankly. Um, so it was well worth the hour. I'm glad you did. And um, I have to tell you that this is going to help me as well in my work, uh, looking at issues such as sea level rise and other oceans uh, impacts, which I had done a presentation, but now I wish I had seen your presentation first. <laughs> So I just wanted to add my sincere uh, congratulations to really an excellent presentation. Sorry, Petra, but I did want to add that in as well. No, absolutely. I think that's uh, uh, very important, Nilofa. Thank you very much. And I was actually coming to that point because I know that Nilofa, uh, she's an absolute expert on sea level rise in, in relation to climate change as a member of the working group for the International Law Commission. So my plan was, because I can't see yet that there are any questions in the Q&A, which probably means that everyone is just thinking so hard and needs to warm up to the idea of being able to ask questions. So please come in with your questions. I've got two questions and then I will hand over to Nilufa and I'm sure she's got uh, more questions. Um, but um, as I said, I think you've covered so much um, uh, terrain here that it's really difficult for people to come up with the one question that they have now most pressing. And it also underlines that we have to come back together here to discuss more after COP26. I think that is another uh, aspect that is really important here to stress. Now, um, so my first question is, uh, very quickly, if I may, um, you know, when the Paris Agreement was adopted, everyone was hailing it as uh, now having three pillars, adaptation, mitigation, or mitigation, adaptation, and compensation. I think compensation really has lived in the shadow, um, certainly of mitigation, probably also of adaptation. And I absolutely share your excitement about Working Group 1 contribution to the IPCC and that for the first time now, um, the IPCC has acknowledged attribution studies. And I also think it would be really important on the in, in domestic litigation, maybe the case of the Peruvian farmer against RWE in, in Germany pending in the higher court of appeal will be the first case where we'll see this uh, being really applied in litigation. But I was wondering and wanted to pick your brain, what does this mean for the international level? I mean, you've explained so well about this uh, Vanuatu proposal of 1991, where they already seem to have the idea that there should be something like a market share liability. So whoever has a certain share of emissions should pay a certain amount in compensation. So would it be possible to bring this idea back to life in the light of the science and the knowledge that we have entered uh, yeah, the time of loss and damages. It's not something that will happen in the future. We are there. That's my first question. And the second one is even briefer. It's about the governance of the whim. Now, um, as you as you know, I mean, in the literature, there was the idea that the whim uh, could now, um, if it is governed by the CMA, 
um, adopt a new edition that um, overrules uh, paragraph 51. <laughs> and that would then lead to a situation where perhaps liability could be included. Now, I would like to know whether you think that's a purely academic uh, discussion or whether there's any relevance to this uh, in, in, in the negotiations and whether you think, since this will be discussed at COP26, is there any uh, room for maneuver? Thank you. Thanks for those questions, Petra, and I'll do my best. Should I wait for more or should I go ahead and, and address those? And then, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that um, many countries talk about the three pillars um, of the Paris Agreement and that loss and damage is another one. Um, I, I think that we, I tried to highlight what I, what I see are some of the limitations around um, around the loss and damage article, but at the same time, it's on the table. It, it managed, as I said, the little fingers managed to get into um, parts of the rule book. And I think that's important. And, and I mean, uh, from, from a very practical perspective, um, some parties I know are actually um, including loss and damage in their nationally determined contributions, which then will be reported on through the enhanced transparency framework. So, so there are ways of, of, of pushing the envelope or expanding the Article 8 confines. Um, I do think that it's quite clear um, that you know, compensation is really off the table as far as the Paris Agreement um, is concerned. And, and it really was, a, like I said, a quick a quid pro quo and, and a decision that was made jointly by consensus amongst parties. Um, and, and I don't know, it seemed like the right thing, I think, for many people at the time. I'm not sure what the implications of that might be. Um, where, where do we go in the international process? <laughs> I think that um, certainly from a finance perspective, and I think when we're talking about comp compensation, we have we're talking about monetary um, compensation. So, so finance is really central to, um, to this. Um, so I know that uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute, for instance, has, has been doing um, a lot of research around financing for loss and damage at the international level. <clears throat> and one of the issues that I know certain um, groups are, are looking at or considering is this notion, and, and the EU has this, a solidarity fund. Um, and you, you also see those similar types of liability funds in, in the oil spill uh, conventions, etc. So, you know, there is, I think, some precedent for um, for this notion of, of, of putting money into a pot for, um, for addressing um, uh, some form of uh, damage um, in the future. Um, and, and a lot of that's based on sort of stronger notions around strict liability. You're dealing with really dangerous stuff and, and you know, bad things happen sort of thing. Um, I think loss and damage is a little bit different in that respect. And, and it's not just a one accident type of thing. It's, it's especially with slow onset events and sea level rise, you know, you have this, this kind of creeping um, uh, irreversible damage. It doesn't just happen overnight, say, with a, with a, a cyclone or a hurricane. Um, nevertheless, I think that this idea of some form of solidarity fund, the model for funding it is, is I think, perhaps the, 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 the issue. Um, for example, the Vanuatu proposal talked about only developed countries. It talked about responsibility in terms of uh, uh, volume of greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, and ability to pay, I think it would be extremely difficult to agree on that form of a funding model right now, because there, the political aspects around that, um, I think, are, are too great right now in my experience. But I don't think that setting up some sort of a, a sinking fund, which is a horrible word in this situation, but a solidarity fund is, is 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 a is within the realm of possibility, and and certainly a lot of Pacific Island countries, but Norway and and um, and a number of, of developed countries have sovereign wealth funds that they use um, and 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 fill up and use um, to um, to benefit other other areas, um, and certainly um, environmental have have environmental uses. So this notion of a solidarity fund or some sort of international sovereign wealth fund, I, I think is is probably far more palatable um, to the broader range of, of parties. Um, so that that could be an, an avenue, I believe, um, to explore. Um, 
in terms of, of financing for loss and damage and, and, and how we think about compensation without calling it compensation um, around um, what science is telling us is going to, is going to be happening. Um, so I guess that would be one uh, approach to that. And I, I have followed the Peruvian farmer case and I know you're extremely familiar with that yourself. And um, I, I, I look forward to seeing how that might, might uh, come out. I know that there's um, also some litigation that Client Earth is doing uh, around um, similar issues in Europe, but also in Australia. And, um, and so, so I think there's potential there for litigation to also push some of the boundaries uh, around that, but maybe at the national, not international level. And then on the governance um, issue, um, yeah, I think, I think for, at least for now, uh, I think that might be a, an academic argument <laughs> around rescinding paragraph 51. Um, that, was, that's, uh, that, that was there for a reason, and it provided enough certainty um, for some parties to be able to um, ag adopt the Paris Agreement as it is now. And I don't really see those similar, those concerns going away anytime soon. Um, yeah, but in principle, a decision can be changed. It's a decision that's not a international binding treaty. Um, so in principle, yeah, but I wouldn't see it happening anytime soon. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, now, Nilofa, please. Yeah, I, I know there's a question in the audience, but I wanted to follow up because, um, <clears throat> and then we'll let the, the question. It's interesting. One. <laughs> Since 1989 to 2021, um, lots of uh, ink spilled, lots of uh, uh, discussions. I'm really curious about what action actually has been taken because we know that um, these, you know, sea level rise, uh, uh, this is happening, um, and um, and 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 at this point, um, many states, particularly small island developing states, are the large ocean states, island states are suffering from this. So what's, what's actually, uh, has there been any projects on this? For example, from the coastal fortification, um, from the law of the sea perspective, we're looking at preservation of baselines, for example, there've been declarations coming out. I know you mentioned the Green Climate Fund. Um, is this a realistic source? But I wanna raise something that follows up on this question of, paragraph uh, 51, article eight, and trying to exclude the liability issue. This is from the Paris Agreement. And it's very good that those states made those declarations because there's also the law of the sea convention. Um, and I know we focus very much on Paris and climate change. And, and so how much are um, the island states also looking outside of that? Uh, because it's pretty clear. I mean, there's you have a whole liability um, provision, responsibility, and liability under Article 235. Um, it's a pre-climate change uh, convention, so it didn't have all the concerns, perhaps, of states at that time. But I think there's a, a very strong argument to be made under the Law of the Sea Convention on this. Uh, and I know there's this, everyone wants to go to the ICJ. There's also another group of students. But, you know, the Law of the Sea Convention, I think, can really provide perhaps stronger <laughs> stronger legal uh, foundation. Um, so I, I, I'm just curious about how much, uh, is there too much of a reliance on Paris? And should the states be looking elsewhere? Um, because Paris Agreement, you know, um, is not a perfect instrument in terms of trying to establish the legal foundation, even though now there have been some successful domestic cases, but those have been on limited basis, I think. So I just wanted to raise this and, and just, if you have any comments on that, Linda? Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad I actually do have a comment, but it's probably not for my own personal experience. I am um, I recently sat in on a, a discussion with some very um, important and uh, illustrious uh, international adjudicators, and um, they have different opinions uh, of, about this. Um, one of them um, actually uh, proposed the same thing that you have, Nilufer, and that ITLOS, the um, International Tribunal and the Law of the Sea, um, was a really a possibly 
po a possible stopping point or a way, way station for international adjudication um, uh, on climate change and why why aren't we using it? So so he was advocating that very um, that very idea and um, and you know he's someone who's done that a lot in, in a lot of different international courts and so I I I think that he's on to something there. So I would say yes. <laughs> um, I've also recently um, been part of some uh, Pacific Island preparatory discussions uh, for COP26 and uh, the Pacific uh, Island developing states, the large ocean states are uh, looking at how to bring ocean issues into the climate change process. And um, some, and some of those um, issues um, around sea level rise, um, the, the, the requirements under the law of the sea around your EEZ, the, the environmental requirements, et cetera, are, are areas of law that they're thinking about um, in, in connection with climate change. So there are, there are people um, moving in that direction, um, which I think is, is really exciting. Um, so yes, I do think the law of the sea, even though it's not a climate change um, uh, convention really has potential, um, certainly from a, a litigation and and uh, an international law perspective. Um, the same uh, uh, meeting that I was at, where, where um, I was listening to these international adjudicators uh, opine, um, another one felt that the advisory opinion route, which is the route that Palau and, and certainly Vanuatu is is a, is a, uh, proposing to take, was is really the way forward. Um, in, in international climate change litigation, um, and and, uh, and and because there hasn't really been in any international climate litigation um, to speak of at all, uh, it's all it, it all really is happening at the domestic level, and 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 what the connection or you know <laughs> uptake um, will be in terms of the modeling and costing and attribution that that gets played out and and experimented with at the at the domestic level. It, could well filter up. I don't know, um, but uh, yeah, I think I'll probably stop there because um, I, I'm not sure I, I have anything more worthwhile to say uh, about that. But to but to say, yeah, I think the law of the sea and that area is definitely a, worth um, exploring in more detail. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I think we absolutely need. To a round table talking about litigation proposals at the international level and how everyone can feed in here. So thank you for that. And uh, there's a question now as well. So again, I encourage you to ask your questions. Now you've got uh, Linda as an expert here and also Nilofa who can answer questions on these uh, aspects. Yes, <laughs> sea level rise. Uh, so I read this out now, Linda, if, uh, if I may. Thank you very much. It was a very comprehensively prepared and interesting presentation. Uh, there is so much to discover on this subject. I agree with Petra that loss and damage lives in the shadow of mitigation and adaptation. Would it be fair to say that developed nations focus on mitigating their emissions and look to adaptation to protect their own populations first, leaving loss and damage last on the list? How can the loss and damage concept be brought to a wide audience outside of the academic sphere to drive action by governments in this area? That's from Chiara O'Connor, by, by the way. Thank you, Chiara, for that question. Thank you, Chiara. Um, it, it's a, I think it's a hard one, actually. Um, I don't think we can afford at this point to um, to leave loss and damage out of the equation because it's happening right now, and I, and it, it's happening everywhere. Um, I think the what, what's happening in the west coast of the United States with the fires, and and certainly in the in the bush in Australia, um, but but far more severe um, tropical cyclones. It, it, it is a, a impacting everybody. And it's not to say that um, the impacts are, are better or worse if, if you're a developed or a developing country, but most developed countries have the wherewithal to, um, to repair, their, repair the loss and damage that is, is incurred in their countries, whereas Many of the um, the developing countries that are feeling these impacts, one don't have the capacity or the 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 um, the wherewithal to to do that. But also, um, you you get into a, a climate justice and fairness um, discussion here, which I really didn't bring in um, 
uh, very much in my in my presentation, and perhaps I should have done that more. But those, especially uh, small island de developing states and uh, least developed countries, and and many countries in in Africa, um, are, don't ha have hardly any emissions at all. And the damages and the losses and 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 the impacts that they're feeling are, are not a result of of anything they can control, and uh, and so I think that there is a there is a a moral uh, question here in terms of of addressing loss and damage in in those countries. Those countries aren't sitting back and waiting, you know, for a handout for sure, um, but but they certainly don't have have the, the historical responsibility for the impacts that they're feeling. So I don't think you can leave loss and damage till later. Um, I may not have fully understood your question, but there is a direct link in the, and the science is telling us this too. The, 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 the more quickly we reduce greenhouse gas emissions faster, like 2030s, the new 2050, the less we will, um, we will need to adapt and the less we will start, the less we will see loss and damage associated with the impacts. So there's a direct relationship between um, mitigation efforts and potential loss and damage. Um, so so it, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a linear path. I don't think you do this first and then you deal with that and then you deal with something else. I think you have to look at the, the picture as, as a whole and, um, and uh, address that and you also have to be uh, cognizant of the moral uh, um, and, and equity issues associated with it as well. Um, I'm not sure how well I answered your question. Thanks. I think you answered it very well. You can probably um, have another lecture about this question, how to bring it into the political uh, debate and then also how to make it an effective political debate. And that's often some something where we have to stop because as uh, from the academic view of point, you can't really do more than talk about these things and publish uh, um, opinions and, and um, analysis and then hope they will be taken up. It's uh, difficult to make this sort of impact sometimes. I've got a question actually in relation to the equitable aspect. I mean, the Paris Agreement mentions equity in the preamble and also in the operational part and intergenerational equity in the preamble only. And again, that is a discussion that predates even the adoption of the 1992 convention. And we haven't really seen um, much progress being made there. But now in this reporting uh, for the NDCs and in the information that must be submitted by states for the NDCs to enhance transparency, clarity and understanding, the, many of them have um, uh, filled in a section where they explain how they consider their own contribution to be fair and uh, in that sense equitable. So I'm wondering whether you think any potential that this will now, if we go through the first reporting cycle that all hasn't st uh, started. And I, I really like that point when Christina focused on that and said that, you know, we haven't seen a full uh, cycle yet, not from the global stock take and not from the um, transparency framework. So if that now happens, do you see that there's then hopefully any potential in bringing in equity more as a legally effective concept and not just a nice phrase. Well, pushing the wrong button, sorry. I was trying to unmute myself and I almost left the meeting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a good question. And, and I don't think it's um, an academic question. I think there's a, 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 a real practical aspect there. Parties are actually required to include in their um, in their NDCs how how they believe that they are doing the best they possibly can and 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 why this is a show of of increased ambition um, and 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 so I think that's probably the hook to to the, the equity question. The GST um, must be um, uh, must include a, an equitable approach um, to this collective assessment of how well we're doing. Um, I mean, it's collective. Um, the, the idea is that, you know, it, it's not a blame game. It, it's a how well are we all doing collectively, but that there needs to be an understanding of the, the, um, the outcomes of the GST, that equity has to figure into um, what, what do we do next. Um, so I think it's already a piece or part of um, not just the preamble of the of the Paris Agreement, but it but it's embedded in in the machinery of the Paris Agreement. 
I've been uh, party to a couple of discussions around equity and how that sits in the GST. And uh, while it's there, no one seems to be able to define it um, outside a kind of more, more kind of airy fairy term. Um, and, and, and so I think that that is probably where academics could be very useful in terms of trying to um, help parties articulate what this equity concept that it, that, that is sitting in um, in the Paris Agreement and in the subsequent rule book decisions. How how do you how do you actually implement that piece of it? Um, so it's there, but um, but there are practicalities I think that that are are, ch are challenging in terms of perspectives on what equity really means. Um, so perhaps some clarity from from the academic community would be really useful in that respect. Thank you very much, Linda. I've got another question here. And I think after that, I will hand over to Nilufa in case she also has a remark or question. And then we're probably approaching uh, the end of our time. So again, uh, from Kimberly Graham here, thank you very much for the comprehensive presentation on loss and damage. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on what some of the differences may be that flow from the whim being jointly governed by the CMA and the COP um, um, as compared to so governed by the CMA. And then another question, a little one on the side, she's saying, uh, given that states are beginning to acknowledge that the time limit may have passed to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions to meet the objectives of the UNFCCC, where does that leave the objective? That's another lecture. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Linda. Yeah, where does that leave the objective? I think the, one of the reasons we have the Paris Agreement is because there were concerns of concerns about um, needing to to inject um, urgency into um, to, to doing the best we can to, um, to to meet the ultimate objective of the convention. The convention's still there. It's still framing um, uh, all of the work on climate change in the international process. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the reasons that we have the Paris Agreement, because there is a recognition that we weren't doing as, as enough and that this was an approach to try and um, improve our, our action in that in that direction. Um, on differences between um, sole versus joint governance, and um, again, this, these are my, my personal opinions. I do I, I do advise um, states, but but this is where I'm thinking a, around this um, is that all the role of the convention and in there and the agreement amongst all parties that the convention has a role in, in, in addressing loss and damage it shouldn't go away um, the, the 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 role of the convention and the functions of the whim which are based on that role took an awful lot of time um, to agree on and 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 those are fundamental agreements amongst the parties with very very different interests and without we, with just sort of cutting the the, the string uh, as it were um, and and saying okay the CMA now uh, governs the, the whim without any sort of fundamental understanding of what of what that governance role is um, is I think per perplexing to me but it certainly is, I think that's it's perplexing to a number of, of countries as well um, and, and so just saying okay, it's this all the CMA now without creating any sort of bridge or any any kind of of legal recognition of what went before and the role of the convention, um, etc. It, it it leaves you in almost a legal land, and I think that um, a number of countries are really concerned about that. Um, again, going back to that quote that I had in, in my in my presentation, it's not about blame. It's not about um, you know pointing fingers and laying blame. It, it's about having as comprehensive a, a foundation as possible for addressing loss and damage, and um, and not to kind of just say, okay, well that that's no longer relevant anymore. And I think that's really kind of the crux of the concern around the governance discussions right now. Um, yeah. I think I might have answered Kim's questions. Yes, thank you very much, Linda. And we've really <laughs> um, had a lot of your time and a lot of your great thoughts here. I'm really grateful for that. I want to hand over to Nilo for first again. Uh, thank you. Gosh, um, we could go on and on. And I hesitate because I know 
we've come to the end of our time, so I really hesitate. But I will, I will just um, uh, perhaps ask one question. And for me, it's really to understand. I mean, again, against the background of decades of work, <laughs> and um, and now this WIM mechanism. And it is supposed to be different, of course, from the adaptation framework. Um, you also have these disaster frameworks. Uh, so WIM should be something standing alone. But I guess my question is, has there yet been a concrete proposal outcome? Um, it, to me, it all seems very abstract right now. Um, so what is it that the, um, particularly the, um, the developing states concretely would like out of um, the WIM mechanism. And I just wanted to add one thought on, on the, that question on the um, joint uh, governance. Um, is there also concern that uh, one thing, and you mentioned, you alluded to, and I think this is one of the issues for the Paris Agreement, that it was intended really to eliminate the annex division. Um, so the division between uh, particularly the annex two countries that were responsible for funding um, and I'm wondering, is there any linkage with that, um, that the Paris Agreement does away with that differentiation? I mean, that's debated, but the idea is it does. So if we have time, um, but uh, otherwise, it was really a fantastic, there's so much we can talk about, and I do hope we can continue this, Petra, <laughs> after COP26. <laughs> it's it, Nilifer, I'll, I'll be really, really brief. Um, and then I'm happy to have an offline conversation with you about this stuff um, later. Yeah, after decades of work, what, you know, why are we, why are we, why, why are we still here? There is work on being done on loss and damage. Um, there's there's a comprehensive risk management. Um, a lot of countries are now including um, limits to adaptation in their national adaptation plans, for example, um, or or. Or in their NDCs, and and these instruments have been funded and are getting funding. So that's one route into perhaps looking at loss and damage related um, issues at the national level, especially if if your NAP is a sectorial, you know, uh, divided up sectorally and that sort of thing. Um, and and the the Green Climate Fund is limited. Um, loss and damage funding comes out mainly from the adaptation window. But you can you can look at uh, GCF uh, reports and and they and they will list um, loss and damage related projects that have been funded. So there are examples of that. Um, I think there's far to go, and it's limited. And and certainly developing countries are, are, do feel a sense of disappointment that more hasn't been done um, yet. Um, but I think we have to remain positive about the possibility of that being done. Um, and and then uh, yeah, there are the expert groups of the of the XCOM bring in a lot of expertise from the disaster risk reduction reduction community, from the finance community, et cetera. And so there's an understanding that the WIM is a standalone um, institutional arrangement, but it can only survive with with you know putting its tentacles out there into into other um, international and regional regimes where where there's a, a a wealth of expertise on addressing loss and damage. So I think I'll probably stop there. <laughs> very good, thank you, that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank again, you, yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely, I mean, a very insightful, tremendous uh, lecture, sharing your expertise here with us. Uh, so much to think about and to follow up on, and this is to be continued, as Nidofa said, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Really agree on that. So thank you again very much. Thank you to the audience as well for your questions Thanks, and for, staying with us on the road to COP26, CMA3, mm -hmm. and hopefully we will see you then after COP again in November on the 26th for a round table, probably again online, and more information will be going out and the slides and the recordings will be made available with everything else that's already been made available in this series on the YouTube channel for CIL, but also for the IUCN and the law school and the university. Uh, so please look that up and uh, thank you again very much, all of you, Lilo as well, Linda. Thank you, Petra. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dan. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Thank everybody. You so much.